Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever, and this is episode 160. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Mark Seafried, one of the show's Patreon supporters, for liking the Weekend Out Facebook page. Thank you, Mark, both for the like and, of course, for your monthly contribution to the show via Patreon. Much appreciated. And speaking of Patreon, I finally finished editing that H.P. Lovecraft story I promised. It's up on Patreon and ready to stream or download. I'm actually going to play a clip of it later on in hopes that it might whet some appetites and tempt a few more people into becoming Patreon supporters. I'm not saying that it's so good you won't be able to resist, but I did put a lot of work into it and I'm hoping at least a few of you might enjoy the sample enough that you'll want to hear the rest of it. Okay, so I want to do something today that may be a first in the history of the podcast. I want to talk about something that has absolutely nothing to do with religion or atheism. Well, maybe a little if we really, really stretch, since our religious beliefs or lack thereof tend to inform our worldview. But I won't keep you in suspense. What I want to talk about is Cecil the Lion. This story has become so big that you may be sick of hearing about it. Uh, But nevertheless, it had such an effect on me that I, I feel I need to talk about it. So for those of you who've been living in a cave or avoiding the news, Cecil was a beloved African lion who lived in a protected park area in Zimbabwe. He was a favorite of tourists and he was also part of an ongoing study conducted by the University of Oxford. Well, it was reported last week that an American dentist named Walter Palmer, I believe, and I have no qualms about naming him, had paid about $50,000 for the opportunity to kill Cecil. He and his guides lured Cecil out of the park by dragging a carcass behind their vehicle. Once Cecil was out of the safety of the park, they shot him with a crossbow, and after 40 hours of suffering with a bow injury or injuries, they finally tracked him down and shot him dead with a rifle, and then proceeded to skin and behead him. I believe it was Cecil's research collar that helped lead authorities to his carcass or remains. Palmer claims he didn't realize the lion he quote-unquote took, or had taken, was part of a research study until the end of the hunt. Now, I like to play devil's advocate against my own views, both in an attempt at intellectual honesty and to test the mettle of my arguments, but also in an attempt to beat my would-be critics to the punch. So the point I imagine people bringing up, which as it turns out they have, both those defending hunting and, ironically, animal rights advocates as well, is that it's hypocritical to worry about this one lion when millions of animals, pigs, cows, chickens, etc., are killed to stuff our bellies every year. Actually, I'm going to read a, a USDA excerpt here, and for some reason, this is referencing statistics that go all the way back to uh, the year 2000. But it says, among mammals, 41,700,000 cows and calves were killed for food in 2000, as well as 150,200,000 pigs and 4,300,000 sheep for a total of 161,200,000. Thus, the total number of all animals killed for food in 2000 was 9.7 billion. And it predicted back in 2000 that uh, these numbers would continue to rise, which it wouldn't surprise me at all if they had. In fairness, I think it's a completely valid point to bring up. Here we are outraged about this one animal when so many animals are killed for food every day, often in horrific conditions. But I think we can do two things at once. We can be outraged by the killing of Cecil and at the same time recognize that we have a big moral dilemma to deal with regarding the way we treat factory farmed livestock. And I think I mentioned on the show before that after viewing some horrific, heartbreaking footage of the way uh, some pigs had been treated in a factory farm or processing uh, center, whatever you want to call it, I actually 
stopped eating pork for somewhere in between a few months to as long as half a year until I eventually fell off the pork wagon. And, and uh, I'm kind of a carnivore with a conscience, which doesn't help the animals I'm eating much. They're still dead either way, no matter how much uh, my heart bleeds for them as I eat their delicious meat. Uh, it's something I struggle with, and I could see myself possibly going vegetarian at some point down the road. Vegan, I don't know, because I don't know if life is worth living without pizza, and uh, I need cheese. But I think the story of Cecil is helping to shine a light on the issue of big game hunting, of hunting not for food, but for sport. I'm an animal lover, and as sad as the idea of an animal falling to a hunter's bullet makes me, I do think it's much more moral to kill for food than to kill for the sake of killing. And I think it's more honorable than the way most of us, including myself, get our meat. Wrapped in plastic or pretty packaging at the supermarket, where we can keep our heads in the sand and forget that it came from a living animal. An animal that may have been cruelly abused by factory workers or accidentally scalded alive hanging from a conveyor in the case of chickens and or turkeys. So I think at least there is some redeeming value in killing for food. As serious and sobering as the taking of an animal life should be to us, at least the animal isn't being wasted and people are being fed. But killing for sport, uh, there is no redeeming value. You're killing for the sake of killing, or worse, killing a living, breathing creature to appease your own vanity. And that reminds me of a story I discovered today about a female hunter who, in the wake of the Cecil controversy, decided to speak up and attempt to defend big game hunting. I'll read a little bit of that article now. And this is from the World Post, and uh, I guess they are in partnership with the Huffington Post. And it's entitled, Trophy Hunter Defends Herself Against Critics in Wake of Cecil Killing. And it's by Simon McCormick. And in quotations, right underneath the title, it says, How can you fault somebody because of their hobbies? A trophy hunter from Idaho has come under criticism after posting numerous photos of herself with the bodies of dead animals she killed. Idaho State University accountant Sabrina Corgatelli's Facebook page features a number of pictures of exotic animals she has hunted, including one in which a dead giraffe is wrapped around her legs. The posts and others like it have garnered plenty of angry comments following American dentist Walter Palmer's killing of Cecil the Lion, which brought widespread condemnation and shined a spotlight on big game hunting. But Corgatelli defended her actions Monday in a remote interview from South Africa on the Today Show. And here it's quoting her. Everybody just thinks we're cold-hearted killers, and it's not that, Corgatelli said. She gave the interview along with fellow hunter Aaron Nielsen. Corgatelli specifically addressed the giraffe picture, saying that giraffes are very dangerous animals. They could hurt you seriously very quickly. Well, maybe they are. They're so big. But... You know when a giraffe isn't dangerous? When you're not near it, trying to kill it? Um, she also noted that, as the Today host pointed out, the hunting she does isn't against the law. Doesn't necessarily mean it's moral. Uh, let's see. Everything I've done here is legally, so how can you fault somebody because of their hobbies? Corgatelli said. She also defended herself in a Facebook post on Saturday. And here she quotes uh, Genesis, not the band, the uh, Bible book. Genesis 9.3 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Genesis 27.3 Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. So she refers to killing animals, other living, breathing beings, as a hobby. And also she quotes the book of Genesis to defend her position. Didn't she notice that it clearly mentions killing for food? I wonder if she eats the giraffes she kills. But what do you know? Looks like we're uh, discussing religion after all. Uh, I don't want to unfairly paint all Christians with a broad brush. In fairness, it seems like you can kind of put believers into two camps or categories when it comes to their their views or their view on animals. Some seem to have the hard-hearted view that we're the crown of creation and that all other creatures are fair game. They're just resources for us to use and consume as we see fit. 
which would seem to be the outlook of that female big game hunter who quoted Genesis. On the other hand, there are also many believers who deeply love animals and see them as God's creations and see us as having a responsibility to be their stewards or caretakers. A Christian big game hunter seems kind of weird. Look at this amazing, majestic creature that our beloved Lord made. Let's put a bullet in its head. Uh, Before I forget, I I might as well cover the tough guy angle, too. So as I alluded to earlier, if you're not killing an animal for food, then you're probably doing it to feel powerful, like you're able to put the brakes on some mighty beast. But that seems so deluded to me. Anyone with enough strength in their finger can pull a trigger and kill a powerful animal from a distance. It doesn't make you tough. I like the suggestion by protesters that you should shoot lions with cameras, not guns. No, that appeals to me, being able to look at a photo and say, yeah, I saw that creature in the flesh once. I wonder how it's doing. I wonder if it's still out there walking the earth. It seems a lot more positive and humane than looking at a dead severed head on your wall. There was another angle I wanted to cover too. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, the Young Turks covered Cecil's killing a couple of times. And being a progressive network, as you might expect, they, like myself, were against the idea of killing for sport. Where I thought they went wrong, however, was when they covered a couple of stories focusing on extreme reactions to the Cecil case. They did one where they focused on people, uh, PETA, I think, if I remember correctly, who thought the dentist should be hanged. They did one about how actress Mia Farrow posted the dentist's business address on Twitter. I actually don't think that's that big a deal. They were saying she was inciting violence. How do you know Mia Farrow was inciting violence? Maybe she just wanted to embarrass the guy or post his dentist's office address for those who want to protest or boycott his business. But I thought the way they focused on those stories made the dentist seem like the victim. I think it would have been better if they kept the focus on the dentist's actions and why what he did was wrong. But hey, maybe I'm being too critical. But a final word on animals in the Bible. It's funny, as barbaric as the Bible can sometimes seem, it does seem to imply at times that animals are to be treated with respect or that they have value as living beings. Think about the story of Noah. Noah and his family don't just take the animals meant for food aboard the ark. They take every kind of animal aboard, even the uh, creepy crawlies. I was about to say two of every animal, but it depends on which version of the story you're reading. The Noah story is an example of something known as a doublet, and that's when you have two different or somewhat different versions of the same story in the Bible. There's two versions of the creation story, too, which differ on the order in which things were created. It always amazes me when Christian apologists try to harmonize the different accounts. I think after the ark finally lands and the flood waters recede, isn't there some kind of concession made where God permits man to now be able to eat the flesh of animals, but it's implied that this isn't the ideal situation But it's uh, more of a concession. I'm I'm trying to think if it's in the canonical Bible or if it's some kind of midrash thing. Okay, so here's Genesis 9-2 through 9-3. And this is from the New International Version. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So on the downside, it says you can eat everything that lives. I don't think PETA will like that. But it does also seem to imply that originally man was supposed to eat plants. But because everything is now messed up, because man is sinful and we live in a fallen world, (laughs) blah, 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 that men and animals have fallen out of harmony. Um, It reminds me of the story of Gilgamesh, which is the Sumerian flood narrative, which predates the Noah story. And in fact, the Noah story seems to borrow heavily from it. But there's a part where the wild man and Kidu, one of the main characters in, in the epic, is tamed by a seductress, yes, by sleeping with her. And suddenly the animals who he lived in harmony with become fearful of him. 
But just because all of the animals are brought on the ark doesn't necessarily mean that the authors or author were trying to teach us the value of animal life. It could also be that's just kind of a geomyth, a myth that tries to explain geological features or natural phenomena, in this case, the existence of all the varied animal species. I think another example of a biblical geomyth is Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt. There are supposedly pillar-like salt formations in the Mideast that can resemble human figures. So the mention in the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah story uh, may have been an echo of that. But for the fun of it, I'll read those uh, flood story doublets. So I'm reading from the New International Version again, and here's Genesis 6.19. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And here's Genesis 7-1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark and you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. How the heck you harmonize or reconcile that? I have no idea. But those are the kind of challenges that people who insist on interpreting the Bible literally present themselves with. (laughs) It'd probably be much more simple to accept the fact that this is a man-made book And there were apparently different versions of the same story kicking around. There's also another Bible story that seems to insinuate a concern with animal rights or welfare. And it's part of the story of Balaam in the book of Numbers, I think. It's the weird little story with the talking donkey. (laughs) Yes, there is a talking donkey in the Bible. I covered a lot of this stuff in a really old episode I entitled God Bless the Animals, but I'll read a little bit from that story. Okay, and this is the New International Version again. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. But it's interesting. It does seem to paint the donkey in this very sympathetic light in that you're meant to feel bad and to to, uh, sympathize with the donkey. Whether or not this little parable is meant to teach us something about how we should treat animals or about being kind to animals, I don't know. I'd like to think so. It, It seems to be doing that. When you think about some of the violence and barbarity in other parts of the Bible, it seems weird that it would uh, take this moment to try to teach us (laughs) about being kinder and gentler to animals. But then again, as with most holy texts, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's wisdom to be gleaned. There's morally inspirational bits. And then there's also anachronistic uh, (laughs) blood-soaked bits as well. But I guess I'll bring this part of the show to an end. And now, as promised, I'm going to play you about six minutes of that H.P. Lovecraft story 
I recorded. And for weeks, I've been refraining from mentioning the name of the story because I didn't want people to maybe go and seek out the story and read it online before they had a chance to listen to it if you've never uh, read it before. But it's The Tomb. The full length is about 24 minutes, but it took me hours to edit because I tried to get rid of every excess little breath and noise. I tried to really make it sound polished and uh, professional. Whether it will sound polished and professional to you, I don't know. I, I hope so. But So I'll play about six minutes of it now, and if you like it and you want to help the show out, you can go to Patreon, patreon.com slash Doubt. And for as little as a dollar a month, you'll unlock um, access to the whole audiobook. And you can either stream it or download it. Okay, but without further ado, here it is. The following work is in the public domain. The Tomb by H.P. Lovecraft. Narrated by Phil Albertelli. In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement... Within this refuge for the demented, I am aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence those isolated phenomena, seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few, which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal, that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them. But the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of supersight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism. My name is Jarvis Dudley, and from the earliest childhood, I have been a dreamer and a visionary, wealthy beyond the necessity of a commercial life, and temperamentally unfitted for the formal studies and social recreation of my acquaintances. I have dwelt ever in realms apart from the visible world, spending my youth and adolescence in ancient and little-known books, and in roaming the fields and groves of the region near my ancestral home. I do not think that what I read in these books or saw in these fields and groves was exactly what other boys read and saw there. But of this I must say little, since detailed speech would but confirm those cruel slanders upon my intellect, which I sometimes overhear from the whispers of the stealthy attendants around me. It is sufficient for me to relate events without analyzing causes. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, But I have not said that I dwelt alone. This no human creature may do, for lacking the fellowship of the living, he inevitably draws upon the companionship of things that are not, or are no longer, living. Close by my home there lies a singular wooded hollow, in whose twilight deeps I spent most of my time, reading, thinking, and dreaming. Down its moss-covered slopes my first steps of infancy were taken, and around its grotesquely gnarled oak trees my first fancies of boyhood were woven. Well did I come to know the presiding dryads of those trees, and often have I watched their wild dances in the struggling beams of a waning moon. But of these things I must not now speak. I will tell only of the lone tomb in the darkest of the hillside thickets, the deserted tomb of the Hydes, an old and exalted family, whose last direct descendant had been laid within its black recesses many decades before my birth. The vault to which I refer is of ancient granite, weathered and discolored by the mists and dampness of generations. Excavated back into the hillside, the structure is visible only at the entrance. The door, a ponderous and forbidding slab of stone, hangs upon rusted iron hinges, and is fastened ajar in a queer, sinister way by means of heavy iron chains and padlocks, according to a gruesome fashion of half a century ago. The abode of the race whose scions I hear and nerd had once crowned the declivity which holds the tomb, but had long since fallen victim to the flames which sprang up from a stroke of lightning. 
of the midnight storm which destroyed this gloomy mansion, the older inhabitants of the region sometimes speak in hushed and uneasy voices, alluding to what they call divine wrath in a manner that in later years vaguely increased the always strong fascination which I had felt for the forest dark and sepulchre. One man only had perished in the fire. When the last of the hides was buried in this place of shade and stillness, the sad urn full of ashes had come from a distant land, to which the family had repaired when the mansion burned down. No one remains to lay flowers before the granite portal, and few care to brave the depressing shadows which seem to linger strangely about the water-worn stones. I shall never forget the afternoon when first I stumbled upon the half-hidden house of death. It was in midsummer when the alchemy of nature transmutes the sylvan landscape to one vivid and almost homogeneous mass of green. When the senses are well nigh intoxicated with the surging seas of moist verdure and the subtly indefinable odors of the soil and vegetation, in such surroundings the mind loses its perspective. Time and space become trivial and unreal and echoes of a forgotten prehistoric past beat insistently upon the enthralled consciousness. All day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss, and conversing with things I need not name. In years, a child of ten, I had seen and heard many wonders unknown to the throng, and was oddly aged in certain respects. When upon forcing my way between two savage clumps of briars, I suddenly encountered the entrance of the vault, I had no knowledge of what I had discovered. The door so curiously ajar, and the funeral carvings above the arch, aroused in me no associations of mournful or terrible character. Of graves and tombs I knew and imagined much, but had, on account of my peculiar temperament, been kept from all personal contact with churchyards and cemeteries.